the story of 96 does start before really the Europeans even arrive here. Um, at that time, the land is being used by several different tribes. Um, you have the largest tribe being the Cherokee. Um, you also have the Saluda, the Congaree, and I'm forgetting one of them. Oh. Nope, not the Catawba, no. actually. <laughs> I always want to say Catawba, but it's not Catawba. It's probably going to come to me in like 10 minutes. <laughs> but by the time the Europeans do start arriving, it's kind of really dominated by the Cherokee. They're using this land mainly for hunting, and they will be hunting animals, um, some of which you would expect and some that you might be surprised about. Um, some of the animals they would hunt, deer, turkey, squirrels, rabbits, and even buffalo. Yeah. Buffalo, yep, yeah. eastern woodland yeah. buffalo. So imagine big old buffalo roaming around in the woods. Will we see them today? Pray not. They no oh, okay. longer <laughs> exist. Here. I know I miss the cows at Town Pen. <laughs> yeah. Um, but when the Europeans arrive, um, they you know come in and like, whoa, look at all these resources especially one in particular. The one resource that really draws them in is the deer hides, the deer. Um, in Europe, deer clothing, especially like men's breeches, is in high demand, high fashion. So they come here and they're like, we can you know, send it back to Europe, make money. I like to make money, right? Um, so that ends up being the main trading item for the Europeans, between the Europeans and the Cherokee. We are along the path that they took from Charleston to Kiwi, which was the closest Cherokee town um, to 96. And it's believed 96 got its name because they thought it was about 96 miles from here to Kiwi. So how far is it really? It's actually like 72 or something like that. <laughs> but, you know, that's by modern day roads. Yeah. So they might have had to, you know, that's yeah, pretty, pretty good. But, you know, you're on a horse, you're kind of, think, I think I went this many miles today, so it's not too bad. <laughs> how far is it from Charles? It is 300 something miles, I think. I don't remember exactly. It's a bit of a waste. <laughs> um, so, the deer trade is the main reason that 96 kind of ends up being, uh, at that point, a big settlement in the backcountry. Now, it is believed that some of our terms for money come from that deer trade. Any guesses to what some of those terms might be? A buck, and there's one more. A doe. A doe, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we do believe that's where those terms come from. Um, now, over time, it starts off just being a little kind of stop on the side of the road, but you start getting a um, settlement really increased by Robert Dowdy's trading post, just like having a store finally. Um, people say, hey, there's a store, great place to settle. Guess what? We're also on crossroads, and we'll see some of those roads as we're going along the trail. Um, some of those roads will be the Saluda, or the one that goes up to the Saluda River, which is known as Island Ford Road. You had, of course, the Charleston Road, and Whitehall Road, which headed towards Augusta, and then, of course, the Cherokee Path. So we will see the remains of some of those. Any questions so far? All right. What was the oh. population around 1750 or something? Don't know the population around then. We do know that by the um, revolution, what was, I think, within, you know, it's a very loose count because the dish, 96th district was huge. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, whether they were counting the district or a certain smaller area around the area, or around 96. Um, but by the time of the revolution, there were 12 buildings in the town. Um, we have 
I think it was like 50 something free men over the age of 18. Don't know slaves, don't know women, and don't know children numbers. Those aren't recorded. I understand that there were one or two prominent Ashkenazi Jewish families in London because they had purchased a couple hundred thousand acres in this part of South Carolina mm -hmm. with the idea of settling poor Ashkenazi in the new world, in the colonies. Yeah. Did that include this area? It may have. I don't. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I would have to do some more digging <laughs> to find out. I have no problem telling you if I don't know something too, so <laughs> I will let you know. All right, as we head on, we are going to cross over the old spring branch. Um, that will actually play a pretty important role during the siege of 1781 because this is going to be the water source for not only the town, but the scarf board. So keep that in mind. Amal. Yeah. And when did they first come here? The settlers? The settlers. You start, so George Hunter, he starts doing a survey for the king and he's here in 1730. Um, by that point, it's already being called 96. So there were traders using the area before that. Um, the settlement itself really doesn't kind of start get going until about 1750, 1760. Was Kiwi still with us? I'm sorry. Was the Indian? Kiwi is actually Kiwi. under Lake Kiwi. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So. So it's still there. It, huh? It's still kind of still there. <laughs> if you can dive away down, because those lakes up there are like real deep, being in the mountains. <laughs> you mentioned the Cherokee were probably they were the predominant Indian here after yeah. a while. When did they start taking slaves themselves? The Cherokee had slaves, they even took them on the Trail of Tears with them. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah. Probably pretty. Quick. He was asking when the Cherokee started taking slaves, because, but I, I don't know. <laughs> All right, we'll head to our next stop.
I did ballet for like one year when I was really little and don't remember anything uh, from it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it must have stuck. <laughs> Probably the only thing that did. <laughs> No, I'm not using the whole thing. <laughs> Just the center. Maybe in a minute. That's what he has on. His kayaking pants on, and so it helps keep him dry. But he's got plastic bags on his feet. Yeah. Very, very chic. It works. Cheers. Oh yeah. Yep. Should it? <laughs> yep. I did that the other night. <laughs> With the black tape and the you know, <laughs> Swiss Army knife and the scissors, you know, and cutting the tape. Have we run it in the snow yet? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> not, not real deep snow. Yeah. yeah. In fact, I was run, uh, went through some snow at uh, Princeton uh, Battlefield. Oh. A number of years going to. Uh, Smithsonian tour with Ed Barnes. We went through some. Who almost froze us today? We went in. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. We were at uh, Washington Crossing <laughs> State Park, <laughs> also there. Is that you, go through, you don't have a plow that you've got in the front. Uh, no, I don't. That's okay. me, running in front of him, <laughs> checking out, <laughs> sweeping the snow out. You have to go to Princeton in the summer with the students. Uh, Ed decided that he wanted it to be. You know, exactly. In right. <laughs> Students just drive you nuts. Yeah. <laughs> you put chain, chains on your tires? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have to stud and snow tires out? I just keep it out. All right. So we've got this, looks like a big old ditch, but this is actually an old roadbed. Um, this is the Island Ford Road. One of those major roads that I talked about. This one went to the Saluda River and then crossed over and headed on kind of towards the um, Charlotte area. Um, but this is a pretty important road. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, so af after the civilization or the village here kind of gets going, you then of course get the revolution coming to town. Um, can anybody tell me when the American Revolution starts? What year? 75. 75. Yep. April 19. 1775. So there is actually a battle here in 1775. Um, it's a small battle, but it is the first land battle in the South. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that one towards the end of the tour when we're actually at that location. Um, but so there's that battle, and then it's kind of a tenuous piece here. Most of your action at that point early on in the war is taking place up north. However, neither side is getting anywhere. They've come to a stalemate. As I like to tell the school kids, if you've ever played checkers, and me and my brother did this all the time, we'd play checkers and we would get stuck. We just got to the point we knew each other so well we could not play anymore. <laughs> um, so that seems to stick pretty well with the school kids um, on what you know, being at an impasse means. So the loyalists or the British forces decide that they are going to kind of change up their tactics. Instead of focusing on the north, they're going to start focusing on the south. They do know that there are a lot of loyalist supporters in the southern back country. They're the supporters of the king. So they will come south take the coastal towns like Savannah and Charleston and start heading in. They'll take Camden, Augusta, 96, and all the forts and little smaller villages in between. So 
this tactic's looking, you know, like it's going to work really well. However, something's going to happen. Can anybody tell me what happens on October 7th, 1780? That's Kings Mountain. Exactly. Um, I know some of y'all probably went to Kings Mountain or have been to Kings Mountain before. Um, so as you may know, the Over Mountain men march over the mountains and take on Ferguson and defeat him, um, kill him, and pretty much destroy his army. That's a pretty hefty blow to the Loyalist forces. I will, by the way, I will just call Loyalist and Patriot, um, just because here at 96, that's what we have. Um, so kind of generalize and those who support the king, I'm gonna call Loyalist. Um, so you get the Battle of Kings Mountain, pretty major victory for the Patriots. That victory is then followed by another victory in January. Anybody tell me what that one is? Cowpens, Cal Cal yep. <laughs> so you get Kings Mountain followed by Cowpens, big victories, looking good. The western flank of the Loyalist Army is pretty dwindled. Um, you then have Daniel Morgan meeting up with Nathaniel Green, who has been put in charge of the Southern Continental Army after Gates' blunder at Ca um, Camden. So Morgan and Green meet up. They start heading towards Virginia, followed very, very closely by Cornwallis, called the Race to the Dan. Um, Green wins that race. He resupplies, drops off his prisoners, and um, Cornwallis has headed back to kind of the middle of North Carolina to Guilford Courthouse. So Green will turn around and head to take on Cornwallis. You get the Battle of Guilford Courthouse in March 1781. Um, interesting battle because technically Cornwallis wins. However, he loses a fourth of his army. And if you keep losing a fourth of your army, whether you win the battle or not, you're not going to win the war. So because he loses so many men, he is forced to withdraw to the coast of North Carolina to Wilmington. Green will not follow him. Instead, he says, I need to come back down in South Carolina and Georgia and finish what I've started there. Finish kicking the loyalists out pushing them towards the coast. So that's what he does. He sends Light Horse Harry Lee, who is the father of Robert E. Lee, um, to Augusta along with Andrew Pickens, tells them, take Augusta, I'm gonna come down and start trying to take 96. Green and his men will march in on the Island Ford Road, this one that we're right beside. They'll come from the north, Across the Saluda River and come down here. Now when they get here, <coughs> sorry, the land does look quite a bit different than what you see today. When they built Star Fort, it's that Star Fort right across there, they cut down all the trees within a mile of the fort. Oh, well, like to tell kids, it's a whole lot easier to sneak up on somebody if there's something to hide behind, right? Yeah. 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 So that's part of the reason. Part of the reason is they are also using all that wood in construction and, of course, firewood and, you know, anything you could think of. Now, Green gets here and he goes, huh, okay, this is a really strong fort. How am I going to take it? Well, he has an engineer with him who has been trained in Europe. Engineer's name is Thaddeus Kajusko. Um, he has come over from Poland. By the way, he is the only non-American born um, fighting in this battle or this siege. So everybody else has been born in America. Um, Green is from Rhode Island. Our loyalist commander, John Harris Kruger, is from New York. Um, so he turns to Thaddeus and goes, you're the engineer? You've had this training, what do we do? Thaddeus goes, hmm, 
this looks exactly like what's in my books. <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, you're a little bit smaller version, but this is, hey, this is the classic, you know, thing to do. We're going to lay siege using trenches. 